Live from New York City, it's The Gary Knoll Show. And now, your host, Gary Knoll. Hi everyone, I'm Gary Knoll. Nice to have you with us today. We're going to talk about how birds reveal the importance of good neighbors for health and aging. University of East Anglia. Then we're going to look at how, and by the way, I'll talk about other animals as well, how stomach cancer cells are virtually halted with a whole tomato extract. And this is from Temple University. And we'll also look at researchers finding further evidence that fats and oils unlock full nutritional benefits of your vegetables, Iowa State University, and how if you have too low a calcium level, you increase your risk of a sudden heart attack and dying, Cedar sinai Medical Center, and how risk factors for heart health are linked to marital ups and downs. Well, that's not good because we shouldn't be concerning ourselves with these ups and downs. Remember, when you have a down, you risk dying. So at what point do you understand, is it worth it? Can we change it? Can it improve? And we have this fetish about showing our parents, grandparents, our, the members of our media community. Yeah, we, we, can, we can weather this storm. Why? What's the point? Oh, well, we'll talk about that. I have a lot on health and healing today, but also I have an awful lot on the environment because there's some things happening you may not be aware of, and I want you to know about it. I want you to know about that we have a massive firestorm burning right now, tens of thousands of acres in Northern California. Now, I was out there recently twice, once to the Sonoma Film Festival, a very respected international film festival. And I generally am so busy, I don't have time to go to these festivals, but I was also doing a lecture for doctors. So I thought, yeah, I'll go. Beautiful country up there, rolling hills, lots of vineyards, and some old, um, some of the old mansions from the 19 teens and 20s. If you ever have a chance to be up there, uh, in the Napa Valley, visit them. It's really pretty, very bucolic. Well, not now. It's all burning. I mean, massive. As of last night, there were 1,500 homes already burned to the ground and over 10 people dying in its mushroom because the wind's up there over 50 miles an hour. So it's burning everything in its wake. Why aren't we talking about what is causing it? Will it happen again? Why weren't any people prepared? One scene that I posted on my own Facebook, my personal Facebook for people, and I post about, I don't know, 20 to 100 articles and things I believe are important from around the world that give a different perspective, a more honest, open, and progressive perspective for independent thinkers. Here's a motorcycle, car, it looked like a convertible, in a garage, burning, the house is burning, the firefighters are outside. Okay, for the people who are in the home, why was your car and your motorcycle, and I'm assuming everything else you own, left there to burn? What are we dealing with in our own minds? Because none of this is a surprise. The recent hurricane hitting in and Texas, neither of those two hurricanes were surprises. The volcano erupting the same time with two additional earthquakes, the two biggest in, at the same time in, in Mexico's history, weren't a surprise. Why aren't we prepared for anything, ever? I want to ask that question. I want to get your response. I'll get to that about this massive firestorm. But it's also happening the same firestorm. Now here's the here's here's how our brains think. We've had a firestorm, the biggest, most deadly, 
in Montana history burning for three months. It's still burning. Not a word. When the same firestorm, but a far smaller one, is burning in Northern California, it's important news. Why is one important, deadly, and the other not? What do we value and not value? We'll talk about that. Also, we're going to look at how the global warming is warming up North America to a point where it's drying up the North American monsoon. Now, this is from Princeton University about new insights into how droughts and wildfires are now impacting us way up further than what they used to. Also, do you know how many earthquakes have occurred in Yellowstone Park? We began reporting this over a year ago. I'm very concerned. I believe that in the the near future, we could see a major uh, earthquake. 2,500 tremors, that's 2,500 tremors since June of this year. That makes us the longest swarm in recorded history. So, and this is according to the U.S. Geological Survey. So we've got a large area, Yellowstone National Park. Is it possible there could be a super volcano that we can be facing? If that is the case, we've got real problems. Uh, And I'll tell you why. Because you shouldn't be having all those tremors. Something's going on, and not a bit of news about it. We bring you more environmental information than any other radio program in the world. And I will keep that going. Plus, I just want to let you know that Richard Gale, one of our scholars and residents, myself, have been working for over a year on synthesizing everything about the environment, reading hundreds of books, thousands of articles, and trying to make sense of our environmental crisis today. In other words, pulling all that into an essay. That essay will be ready in probably the next week. So my hope is to broadcast it over a full hour. I think I can get it in one day. If I can, it'll be two days in a row, but it will be the most powerful, insightful, comprehensive, understandable discussion on the environment you've ever heard in your life. What you do about it is up to you, but at least you'll have the information because nothing is getting better anywhere in the world. It is all getting worse. That does not mean that there are not things we can do. Absolutely, there's a lot we can do, and you can get out of harm's way, but not if you're not paying attention. We'll go also today to part two of my discussion of what it was like to live in the 14th, 15th, 16th, you name the century, I'll tell you what it was like. As a, just a farmer, a peasant, a merchant, a member of the royal court, and nobility. But today I'm going to add some more details to it. I didn't have enough time yesterday, but today I'm giving myself extra time to get into great depth about what they talk about. I mean, what did you do all day? What did you spend your time actually doing? I think that's interesting. So I'm going to share that with you. I haven't selected which country. I'll just decide that uh, when we get to that part in our show. And for those of you who look at what's going on now with Black Lives Matter or the civil rights movement or police harassment, I'm going to play you a very rare clip. I knew Gil Noble. I considered him one of the finest journalists in America right there with Tony Brown and Bill Tatum, a lot of them uh, were not afraid to take on the issues. And he did an interview that was one of the most startling and candid I've ever seen with a person who had been selected by the FBI, an African-American male, articulate, charming, educated, to go into all the different African-American movements, infiltrate them, and tell us what they're doing. And he told Bill Gil Noble all this. You'll have a chance to hear it. Now, when you're hearing him say what he and, are you ready for this? 
thousands of other African Americans were doing as infiltrators into black organizations, provocateurs, committing murder that the FBI knew about, arson, burning down buildings and homes that the FBI gave them the tools. You think this can't happen. This, there must be something here that doesn't make sense. And then ask yourself this. Why is it that no one that I've ever spoken to, maybe to other people, yes, at Pacifica, has ever wondered, is it possible that the organization is so bad, so mismanaged at every level, from local station boards, never getting anything done, always fighting, the racism, everything goes on, covering up sexual assault and sexual harassment, and knowingly doing this, even to this day. Anyone challenged me on it? Big mistake. Because, boy, is there something bigger, bigger than Bill Cosby, bigger than Bill Clinton, bigger than Harvey Weinstein waiting in the closet to come out. And it is going to come out. But that's up to the victims that decide to come out. And all this known by the top people. Do you ever figure that maybe some of this was intended by FBI? That they could be completely infiltrated at every level? Because I'm going to show you they did it in the past. Well, if they did it in the past, you mean they suddenly said, we will no longer ever infiltrate any organization. We will no longer act as agent provocateurs. We will not. They have probably 10 times more people now in every peaceful organization, environmental organization, human rights organization. If you're anyone with a brain and a conscience willing to speak up today, you can bet that they're going to have you on a list. I'll deal with that also on Not Today Show, because the piece I want you to hear is about 20 minutes long. You've never heard this before. Boy, do we need this piece today. Also gives you new insight about Malcolm X. Gives you new insight about his murder that you have not heard before. So, I like to share things that get people thinking. We're going to start with something that I don't think crosses anyone's mind. Birds. Birds who live next door to family members or to other birds they know and know well are physically healthier and age more slowly. That's according to the newest research out of the University of East Anglia. The research conducted in collaboration with colleagues at the Universities of Leeds in the United Kingdom and Groningen in the Netherlands, and it was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, our number one scientific journal. But what's it mean? It means that much like humans, many wild animals own a private piece of land or territory that they rigorously defend against intruders, but having good neighbors that respect the territory boundaries means less work and stress for territory owners. But are some neighbors better than others? Good neighbors come in two varieties. First, when neighbors are extended members of your own family. They share genes and therefore refrain from fighting over space or family members. They share, they, they share let's say, uh, respect for others' territories. And second, if neighbors know each other well, they should keep the peace and cooperate with each other in order to prevent new neighbors with whom they must resettle all the rules regarding territorial boundaries from moving into the neighborhood. So, this is one of the reasons, one, only one, that when you've lived near people that you like, you create a, an unspoken bond. And I can remember growing up, I was born in a little tiny house under, uh, I think it was about 800 square feet, on Beaver Street, Parkersburg, West Virginia. And right across the street was my best friend's house, Tom Croft. Well, Mrs. Croft and the person that would uh, purchase the house when we moved out, Mrs. Zoller, they were within a rock so of each other because it wasn't big streets. So the, every day they went through the same rituals. They'd take care of their kids and then take care of their house, and then they'd go out and sit on the porch and they'd read the paper, and they would, they would give each other nods. Well, I went back there not long ago. I just wanted to see what had changed in, since I grew up. And I walked down the street, 
and a whole lot had not changed. And I walked down Beaver Street and nothing had changed. And there were two people, I guess now in their 90s, who, same ritual, sitting there nodding. I said, do you ever go over and have tea? Do you ever talk? No, but we, we're friends. We're good friends. That kind of identity that you know your neighbor and that that knowledge, you have nothing to fear for them from them and there's a familiarity with them and their kids may play together. But that's a, it was a different type of socializing. People tended to keep more to themselves of that generation. That's the greatest generation, people who were born and grew up before or during the Great Depression. Now, the same is true for animals, and I've seen this with animals. I'll just give you one little example. Because when you've helped so many animals, over 3,000 that were rescued, and bring them back to health, both physical and emotional, and find a permanent home for them, hopefully back in the wilds, or on a big uh, animal preserve, thousands of acres up in the northeast, northwest, where people are there, foundations run it, so animals can live out their lives in comfort and safety and peace around other animals and have a social bonds. And it's particularly important for older dogs because we forget that older dogs, when a, you know, the kids have gone away to school and everything was great when they were puppies, now you know, they've kind of got left behind and don't always get the attention and time they deserve. Because their whole life is there for you. And we, unfortunately, if we don't know what it is to have a companion, we should not have a companion. Unless you're willing to be with that companion your whole life and devote quality time every day to it, you shouldn't have it. It's undeserving to the animal. It's disrespecting what they need. But there are some people, the quality of their lives are enhanced because of it. I can tell you an awful lot of people have found more comfort and their companions, birds, cats, dogs, horses, than they have in humans. In fact, sometimes when a person's gone through a rough patch, they don't want anything to do right now in a relationship with people because they've been hurt, and they're fearful of being hurt again. After all, they trusted before. What happens if they trust again? But they know they're never going to be hurt by their pet. Isn't that amazing? They're never going to cheat on you. They're never going to lie to you. They're never going to, they're never going to hurt you. They're always there for you and they give their lives for you. Now, we see this all the time. Everyone knows this. Everyone who has a heart knows that, or sensibilities. If you're just thinking through your body politic, well, then you never have to worry about having either a heart attack or a stroke because you don't have the brain, you don't have the heart. You just got an attitude. And unfortunately, a whole lot of Americans have attitudes with nothing else to go behind them. But sometimes it's the humility of having that pet that brings us to a lever, a level of, comfort of being mindful in the moment we're in because we're giving conscious attention to something. And that's a good thing. And then you start seeing that other animals are not quite sure where they belong, what they can do, what they can't do. And so they kind of keep in one area. But the little, the little babies, they don't know where they belong. They'll belong anywhere. They're just thinking, hey, everybody's my friend. Aren't we all part of a family? And you watch a little baby heifer. And I've been watching a little baby, uh, a little baby Jenny, that's a little female. And the mother was dry, so we had to get a surrogate mother. And we have, I have one, a, a, a woman who specializes in, uh, in raising babies that have been, adore, uh, uh, let's say, abandoned or in some way uh, rejected. It's hard to imagine there are circumstances where a baby will be rejected. And if it's not immediately taken in, it'll die. And you have to care for it. When it's hungry, you got to feed it. you got to nurse it. you got to cuddle it. you got to kiss it. you got to hug it. you got to let it sleep beside you at night. All these things you'd never think about. I actually know someone that thought it was a great idea to go to a part of India to rescue elephants, and they had rescued some baby elephants. And... Uh, so when the mothers who had been in chains were being healed of their wounds, someone had to take care of this, these babies. So volunteers would spend the night in this barn sleeping beside the baby. They'd put hay down and they'd hose it down and then rubbing. And that little baby would come over to you. Now, mind you, a little baby elephant doesn't realize how heavy it is. So it just wants to get right up there and it wants to take its 
trunk and wrap around your your face and give you kisses. It 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 loves you. So these people had to be pretty strong, but then they just they felt so much affection, and so they ha- actually helped raise these little ones. Now these little ones could go anywhere, anywhere at all, around any other animal, and the mother was always watching. Boy, you don't want to you don't want to do anything that gets a mother elephant uh, in any way excited that somehow her baby is in danger. Because all the female elephants come rushing, not just the mother, all of them. Because in the elephant family, everyone is related, and therefore everyone counts. But you watch this little little creature grow up. And it goes over, and there's an abandoned squirrel. Now, normally, 100% of abandoned squirrels, as babies die. But these were found right after the hurricane, the day after it stopped, with a little bunny, and put the bunny and the squirrel together and raised them. Well, now, that little squirrel is healthy as can be. So when it comes out in the morning, it jumps right up on uh, the caretaker's uh, shoulders, goes up and plays in her hair and runs around. And all morning long, when this person's going around and cleaning environments, and because and, I want all the animals to have fresh, clean bedding every day and their environment clean and let out to run around and explore life and climb trees, whatever they do, um, there it is. So now the little, the little baby squirrel jumps on the little Jenny. And little Jenny looks up at her, these big eyes, and says, okay, how, who are you? Yeah, I'm, the little squirrel, I'm the little squirrel, and I'm having a fun time. So now the squirrel and the Jenny are together. Then they go over to Sweetie, the, uh, the capuchin, and Sweetie's looking, and they're very territorial, very territorial. All capuchins are, but not ring-tailed lemurs. Others are not. They are. So now here you've got your initially... Don't come near my my whole area here. This is all mine. But now, sweetie, puts food out for the little monk uh, for the little donkey. The little donkey comes over, gets the food, and when she's getting the food, sweetie's now petting her and playing with her ears. Now, sweetie looks up, and there's a little squirrel. Normally, a squirrel and a capuchin do not go well together. But it's a baby squirrel. The baby squirrel doesn't know it's not a monkey. Doesn't, it doesn't know what it is. It thinks it's like everyone else because everyone's loving it. So now you've got the little squirrel on the head of the donkey. The donkey being petted by the capuchin. Now the capuchin feeding the squirrel and petting the donkey. You've got to see this stuff. I'm taking pictures of it. <clears throat> what it shows is that in nature, depending upon how thing how how the creatures um, align their environments where they live, they can live in harmony as long as they understand or come from the same bloodline or are not threatened by the other species sharing their environment. Humans are very similar. Look at how good we feel about good neighbors. In fact, I'm sure many of you have gone out of your way to be a good neighbor. You've, you've tried to cooperate with your neighbor in times of stress. You've tried to help your neighbor. You want to show them, I'm a good neighbor. And we all know what it means to be a good neighbor. We also know what it means to be a bad neighbor, a gossip, uh, malicious behavior, and negative. And you know the, how this disrupts you personally and emotionally and how you feel about it. So this study is showing that animals, birds, and I can tell you other species, are, liver, are going to live a longer life and a happier life if they feel comfort in their living environment. It's no different for humans. We should just consider that. Also, from Temple University, their Institute for Molecular Medicine, they did some research. Now, if you're concerned about stomach cancer and your overall digestive health, What I'm going to share with you will be of interest. We know that the Mediterranean diet has become regarded as highly beneficial to overall health. 
Is it the most perfect diet in the world? No, it is not. I could tell you about the diet in the island Crete. In fact, when I go there next next spring, I'm going for a week to do some filming. And, and are people around the world who want to come for a week and see how I do a documentary in an isolated environment, but learn a lesson about the people, I'll open it up for people who want to just get there and you can watch and listen and learn because I'll sit for hours with the elders and ask them about their whole history and their diet, their exercise, and their how you deal with problems in the world around you. And it's fun, but it's also very educational. So the Mediterranean diet's a really good diet. Not perfect, but really good. Light years ahead of anything that we're doing in the United States. And they do not have the same problems being overweight or having a higher risk of cancer or heart disease than we do. And one of the staples of this diet is tomatoes, especially the low-acid varieties that are grown in Italy, and they are known to impact cancer. Well, the research at the Institute of Molecular Medicine at Temple University in Philadelphia has confirmed that two tomato cultures grown in southern Italy inhibit, I repeat, inhibit, both malignant features and cellular growth in stomach cancer cells. That's a big deal. And that in turn leads to cancer cells dying. So I'm very uh, excited when I find that something's able to inhibit cloning behavior in malignant cancer cells as well as impede their growth. One more reason, and by the way, these were scientists in the National Cancer Institute of Naples uh, and the National Research Council of Italy. And it was published in Journal of Cellular Physiology. So my suggestion is this. Start having more tomato juice. Have more tomato, dried, sun-dried tomatoes. Because those you can actually get from Italy, the same tomatoes. And then all you do is you simply dice them up and put them in your brown rice or a baked potato or a soup, a saute. And that way you can bring them into your diet. We also know from Iowa State University that where a lot of people think that all oils are unhealthy because they're higher in calories, they're not. And they showed that by having healthy oils, we all know what the healthy oils are, that you're going to end up having a healthier cell. This was published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. So... Eat the healthy oils, coconut oil, olive oil, flaxseed oil. Yeah, those are your healthy oils. And simply be healthier. By the way, there are a lot of studies on this. And finally, from Cedar sinai Medical Center, make sure you're getting enough calcium because when your calcium levels are low, you increase your risk of a sudden cardiac arrest, meaning a heart attack. And this was proceedings from the Mayo Clinic. So keep from dying because 90% of all heart attacks are fatal. So I don't want you dying. I want you healthy. I'll save tomorrow's uh, for tomorrow from a journal I read in the Epidemiology and Community Health about what happens when you argue in a relationship. Whoa. Does it really bring you that close to dying from a stroke or heart attack? Yes, it does. But more on that tomorrow. Now I want to share a few things from our environment. This is from Princeton University, and it's new sites in the drought and wildfires of the southwest and the northwestern uh, part of Mexico because researchers have struggled to accurately model the changes to the abundant summer rains that sweep across the southwestern United States and northwestern Mexico, known to scientists as the North American Monsoon. But in an article published in the current Nature Climate Change, they are understanding that this is all changing. There's no longer capacity to accurately predict. And part of it is simple to understand. When the temperature rises in the ocean... 
by even one degree, you are increasing the available moisture to cool, go up and form into clouds and become rain by up to seven degrees. I saw a photograph, and first I thought it was photoshopped. So then we ran a verification check. And no, it was not photoshopped. It was a photo, and I posted it. You can see it up on uh, go to GaryNull.com. And by the way, I, I, for a long time, I didn't know that only 5,000 people at a time could s- go up there on my personal Facebook. So my, our IT people did something that an unlimited number of people can go up and watch these, look at the stories and the photos. So here is a photo. I'm guessed taken about 10 miles away, up, up high, probably someone in the, in the hills around Phoenix. And it shows a cloudburst over Phoenix. But it's not just like heavy rain. It's as if someone poured a, a five, uh, 50-gallon drum of water over your head all at once. The entire sky around there was soaking with just sheets and sheets and sheets of rain. That is what's happening now. That's why Louisiana had a a once-in-a-500-year storm where you had flooding. And then they had it again, and then again. In fact, we have had over 10 once-in-500-year storm events in the last two months in the United States. And yet there's people still disagreeing that global warming is real. It's real. So now what's also real is because of the changing in these patterns, you are now having where it was rainy, no longer. And where it was dry, hyper dry. So dry that the soil's heating up so much that seeds planted will not germinate. And seeds that were planted and to Germany will wither. They don't come to full maturity. They start to see this in wheat and corn. And, uh, and when you consider uh, three largest crops grown in the United States are soy, corn, and wheat, and we're not able to grow those in North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana, Kansas, our breadbasket because of overheating, not in the same way they used to be grown, but now that's here in the United States. When you go to other countries like Syria that was the breadbasket in the Middle East, that whole Mesopotamian area, the reason for the conflict in Syria initially had nothing to do with politics, had everything to do with Syria was the big producer of grains, and then the drought for five straight years decimated them. And then in came the people from the country and flooded the cities. And then in came the agitation. Then the United States saw a great opportunity for regime change, which they wanted with Israel and other countries. And that's how all this came about. But it initially started with drought. Right now in in Egypt, massive drought. And the Egyptians are fearful that there's going to be a war with two other countries that control the source of the Nile before it goes through Egypt, which is their sole source of water. So the wars of the future will frequently, more likely than not, be fought over natural resources, including water. They're currently one half of all the, uh, of all the, uh, the countries are without adequate water. And only 1% of all the world's water is drinkable, clean water. 1%. And we're not doing a thing about it. And we better. Because when our soil heats up to where seeds can't germinate, and we get flooding, so what does grow is is, is rotted out. And seasons are changed radically. And we start having these extraordinary... Uh, occurrences, and we're not paying attention, we, we're in trouble. Let me give you what I consider possibly one of our greatest concerns. And this is from, I'll read this, this is from Russell Davis from Natural News. Quote, The U.S. Geological Survey recently announced that an ongoing earthquake swarm at the Yellowstone National Park supervolcano is now one of the longest ever recorded activity in the volcano's history. The earthquake swarm began on June 12th and has since 
then made a remarkable record of almost 2,500 earthquakes registered during the previous three and a half months in the western part of the National Park. According to U.S. Geological Survey, the ongoing activity is now in close ties with the biggest earthquake swarm recorded in 1985 at more than 3,000 earthquakes over a three-month period. And then it goes on to talk about why this is so dangerous. Now, most of these are like 2.3 magnitude, but they've also recorded a couple at 4.4. So when you start getting above 4 and you're having thousands of these, you have potential for an explosive Yellowstone eruption. But in the future, I'm not suggesting, I don't want to scare people, telling them, oh, you know, it's it's all going to blow. It's not. But we should be doing a great deal of research on it, and we should ask ourselves, what is the likelihood that part of that area could explode, just like Mount St. Helene? What, uh, What should we do? Let's have a plan A and a fallback plan B. Right now, we don't have any plan, and we should. And also, I just want to send out my concerns, and I know your concerns, to the good people of Northern California who woke up this last week only to be warned that there were massive fires in their area. Some of these people had never experienced a fire in their lifetimes in that area, but not now. And that could lead to the area suffering from economic collapse. And we're talking about a firestorm burning tens of thousands of acres, at least 15 different firestorms in a relatively small area. I mean, it's small. You can drive from one end of Napa to the other in under an hour and then all the surrounding areas as well. And, quote, the nation is still reeling from a series of major disasters in recent weeks, and now another one has hit us. At this moment, an enormous firestorm is consuming tens of thousands of acres in eight counties in Northern California. Wind gusts of up to 50 miles an hour are rapidly driving 15 large wildfires across Napa, Sonoma, Lake, Mendocino, Yuba, uh, and Nevada, and Calaveras and Butte counties. And the devastation that is taking place is being described as like Armageddon. Ultimately, it looks like this is going to be one of the worst months for wildfires in the history of the state. And all this comes on the heels of the Hurricane Harvey, Hurricane Irma, and the Las Vegas shooting. Ever since late August, it seems like all hell has broken loose in America. So far, at least 1,500 structures have been destroyed. At least 20,000 people have been evacuated. And at least 73,000 acres have been burned. The smell of smoke has reached San Jose, Oakland, and San Francisco, California. And Governor Jerry Brown has officially declared a state of emergency. When I was last in San Francisco and just to be picked up there and driven up to, I I was one of the keynote speakers for thousands of doctors who were taking a a continuing education credit course for a couple of days and I was teaching clinical nutrition. And uh, it was a two and a half hour ride. And I was just looking at going through Oakland and going through that whole area, Marin County, how absolutely overbuilt it is, over-congested it is. And the driver said that he used to live in San Francisco, but now he and his wife live closer to Napa. And I said, that's a long way. He said, that's now the new bedroom community for San Francisco. I said, you're kidding. You're, drive, you're commuting five hours a day? He said, I get up at four in the morning in order to do my first pickups at the airport. And many times, I have to drive him back up here. Then I got to drive him back down, and then I got to drive home again. He said, there are days where I'm on the road 10 hours. He said, that's one of the problems. He said, too many people wanting to live in an area. The cost of everything skyrockets. It's all a bubble. The quality of your house, the views, everything is the same. 
It's just more people want to be here, and those people wanting to be here are willing to either they have the money to buy or they're getting mortgages so they can afford to live here. And now, and now I said, you know, do you ever think what happens when there is an earthquake and there will be one, it's long overdue, or a major fire? He's well, we haven't had the problem with the fires. But yeah, it, 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 but no, Gary. And I remember we were, just, he, we were just starting the ride back at the end of the day. And he said, no. He said, uh, our tendency here is we got great weather, nice people, and we don't think about a crisis until it happens. Then you get our attention. Until that time, you won't. And that was it. I mean, that's one man, but one man who speaks with thousands of other people. Because what do you do when you're on a long commute? You talk about, uh, you want to know about the people. If, if you're at all curious, you want to know about the culture and the people you're in, even the United States, because we have so many different subcultures in the United States. So when I saw that motorcycle and I saw, and I posted it, you can say it for yourself, and I'm thinking, he knew that his house was at risk. Why didn't he just have a trailer? Everyone in America, if you, if you can afford a house, you can afford a $400 trailer. All right, I have one. It's, it's loaded to go. I have a 55-gallon drum of gasoline ready. If I never use it, good. But if there's ever fire, then there's a plan. Um, from fire suits, which are cheap, every home uh, should have a fire suit. That way you can get out of harm's way. At least you and your family will not burn to death or end up with serious burns. And then you plan in advance. How long will it take? Do it to, Actually time it. How long will it take to get our most important possessions? Your driver's license, uh, bank books, uh, computers, uh, jewelry, uh, clothes, uh, furniture. The things that you would find important in each person. That's going to be a different priority list. But to get them onto a trailer and then drive out of harm's way. It doesn't take long. But imagine the people who say, I lost everything, and you said, but the fire's been here three days. Why didn't you do something? And then you start seeing that we as a country are not prepared. And part of the problem is we're not preparing people. We're not letting them know how bad it is because we don't want people to get overstressed and think maybe they should move because if enough people start moving from an area, especially uh, one that's been overinflated in value, property taxes are going to go right down behind it because property taxes are tagged to the artificial value of your property. I just think it's time to have open, honest discussions on this topic. I'd like to welcome all of you to the program. I'm Gary Knoll. How often have we wondered, wow, Was it really that good when I was growing up or different parts of my life? Was there that complete sense of innocence? Uh, Was there less hassle, less responsibilities? Or have I just in some way justified justified it as being better than what it actually was? Well, I'm sure, depending upon different circumstances, things were better. I know that they were certainly calmer. I can remember one of the greatest moments, not greatest, but one of the most comforting moments as a kid sitting on uh, the porch with my mom as a kid, and we would sit in the swing, and she just liked to sit and swing in silence, and I, I thought, this is nice, this is cool. Well, it was. Doesn't mean you can't do it today, and I'm sure people do. But what was it like when you went back beyond your mom, dad, back generation upon generation? I'm going to take you back to Versailles. There is no question that Versailles would, by anyone's measurement, be in the top most ten most beautiful original design structures and furnished structures in the world. Not the best in my opinion, but those I found in Russia would be my number one pick. But Versailles is beautiful. And we should know more about the life of Versailles from around Henry the 14th from the Duke of uh, St. Simon, or Simon. Versailles was built, first of all, in swampland, and it was described by a visitor in 1764 as a 
a smelly cesspool of dead cats and urines and excrement, slaughtered pigs and standing water mosquitoes. And that wasn't a criticism. That was just an honest assessment. Who would have thought? There were hundreds of courtiers. They lived alongside the royal family with their families. So you really have layers of people. You had the the farmers who were entrusted to grow certain produce or animals for consumption. You had the wardens. The, The warden was the person that would oversee the venison or the deer or the wild boar, uh, because if you didn't, anybody and everybody who could come in there and kill it for themselves would have. But what was it like? It was a pigsty. You see, today when we see it, it's because it's been polished and cleaned and sanitized. Reality, Versailles was, it was filthy dirty all the time. There were no bathrooms. The courtiers and royalty used decorative commodes in every room, or most rooms. So you could be in a group of ten people in a room, and each person could go over and just sit on this little commode, and there'd be a little pot, depending upon your, your standing in the line of royalty. Uh, the pot would have its own person take it out and dump it, or not. But nobody wiped so you had excrement all over yourself. Nobody cleaned themselves. And But if you were a commoner, if you were not a member of royalty, you were allowed to relieve yourself, defecate or urinate in any of the hallways or stairwells. But there was no one to really clean it up, so you had to step around it or over it or in it. No one bothered uh, to house train any of the royal dogs, and there were a bunch And servants did not consider cleaning up after them as part of their job description. No one bathed. Ever. Taking a bath was not considered good for people because it was superstition that somehow the water would create disease. Consequently, there was a real problem with lice and bugs infesting clothing. Chimneys did not draw well, and so everything inside was covered in soot and stunk Now, during the 17th century, theologians, and in particular Bosset, who came from noble blood, developed the idea of the divine right of kings to demonstrate that power and authority were of divine origin. Louis XIV believed himself a direct representative of God. And depending upon the day, there were between three to 10,000 people. Let me repeat that. Three to 10,000 people surrounding the king's court. And it was a highly variegated and strict hierarchy. The high-ranking nobles were constantly present and had to follow a strict etiquette. Body language and manners of speech, even rules whether your status permitted you to sit in an armchair or a chair or a stool uh, was necessary. You couldn't talk if the etiquette was that you were only to listen to those who were of higher rank. But there were special places where you could gossip. And most of the day, most people spent their day gossiping, jockeying for positions of power, if you were at court. But not everyone was equal. Let's just say that you were of nobility, but down the line. Uh, Like the royal Saudis today have 5,000 members of the Saudi royal family, but only those in the inner circle, the top 100, have real privileges. Everyone else is financially supported, and you can say you're a Saudi royal, but you're not one of the billionaires who can go spend whatever you want anywhere and do anything you want anywhere and get away with it. The same was true at the court. So when you woke up in the morning, uh, you were expected to go to the breakfast, and the breakfast was to watch as dozens of dishes, sometimes up to 75 different dishes, would be paraded uh, into this uh, chamber, and everyone was to stand there fully dressed, even if it were boiling hot, No air conditioner, no no fans. Uh, The royal could have someone fan them, but no one else. And you might it might be ninety degrees in there, and you're dressed in all your clothing, stinking to high heaven, and waiting for them to select a bite of this, a smell of that, a taste of that, and the rest was sent back to the kitchen. Then, after they had eaten, then you would go and eat, and you would eat 
uh, generally a selection of meats and breads and ale. And of course, there was no brushing of the teeth, and there was no flossing, there was no dental picks, there was nothing. So oral hygiene was horrific. People had swollen gums, they had bad breath, they had coats of slime in their mouth, um, and then they had the head lice. Whoa, there comes the head lice. Everybody had head lice because there was no hygiene. And also, some people stayed in their clothes all the time. But it wasn't cool to stay in your clothes all the time if you were a royal, meaning if you were one of the, let's say, 2,000 people who had high appointments and or were in the service of the royal family. So then you had to find ways of getting money to get a dress made or a suit made, and that was the whole month you would spend on that. And you would have your own little circle. Everyone had their own little circle of gossips, and you would gossip about who's doing what and who's having sex with whom, and, uh, and everything that was of some kind of lecherous nature would be discussed, especially someone who was a mistress of the, the king. And there were frequently many, but there was one in particular, and she, in fact, one of the, one of the gardens at Versailles and one of the most beautiful homes at Versailles was not for Marie Antoinette, it was for the mistress. In any case, um, that's what you did all day. Um, and then in the, you had three meals, and you pretty much had the same food at every meal. It's just it was decorated, decorated differently. But it all came from the royal kitchens. The kitchens were filthy. There was no water in there. No one washed their hands. And you really didn't have to go outside to defecate. So you could just defecate in the kitchen if you wanted. Now imagine the kitchens cooking all day long. Under normal conditions, being a chef, and many of you, I've cooked your meals on Wednesday night at Gary's Place back in the 1980s and 90s. And I'd cook 400 meals a night. And it was boiling hot in there. You know, you have a scarf on uh, around your neck. You got one, of, uh, you know, you got a bandana on to try to catch perspiration. And you got air on and you're still boiling. Now imagine you've got 60 ovens and 100 spits roasting pigs and venison and, and roasting ducks all day long. You had people who were... They were relegated to pluckers. They would pluck the chicken. Others would pluck the geese. Others would pluck the, uh, uh, the swans and the pheasants and the wild birds. So everybody was plucking something, filthy dirty, and then they would save those pluck to go into the royal's mattresses or into their pillows. But did they ever actually go and wash that? No, that was rare. So everyone stunk. When we talk about Smelling. I'm talking about smells you have never imagined in your life. So what you would do that once a year, they would suggest uh, that you have marriages. And you would have marriages generally in May or June because then it was warm enough for the average person to get water out of a lake or a river. And generally they didn't boil it. Inside they did, but not outside. But then every person had to... St- take their turns, starting with the oldest man, sons, oldest woman, daughters, and finally the baby, and hence the term, don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. But it was filthy water. And the reason they did that, because it was thought that it is better to start a marriage without smelling bad. So as long as you had a bath within a month of consummating your marriage, that was okay. Now we're, we're much more hygienic, at least most people are, but there was no one hygienic back then. And also you had the clothes causing sweat. You had the lice, so everyone's head was shaved. That's why the wigs. So then you had to have a special wig maker. And then the gossip was who spent the most money on which wig, and, and the wigs were dusted, your hair face was dusted, and everybody was made up, and that would take hours every day. All the while, a person being made up would be sitting and gossiping about what was going on at court, It was just idle discussion for those individuals. For the royals, it was talking about the politics and and, uh, uh, their allies or enemies and strategizing. The bureaucrats were just running the government. They also were there. As many as 1,500 bureaucrats lived there, but not in the same accommodations. And there were no running water and no toilets in any of the rooms. Well, what do you do if it's 2 o'clock in the morning? You've got to go to the bathroom. Well, there's a chamber pot. You don't go throw it away. No. It's going to stay there and stink all night long. But then again, how would you know if there was a pot full of crap because you haven't bathed? 
your bed hasn't been cleaned, your linen wasn't washed, you got head lice, you got slimy goo coming out of your mouth, every orifice is dank and dirty. So exactly how can you distinguish one bad smell from another? I guess they could. And of course, nothing was clean inside. So if they brought animals into the palaces, well, they were in the palaces. And along with the animals came fleas. And by the way, also uh, very easy to get typhus at that time. So that was the daily life at court. And some people were rich enough that they could have, like Marie Antoinette, uh, she changed fashion in France. She refused to wear a corset and invented the styles of shoes known as the pumps and mules. She made clothing more simple and comfortable. And she bathed, when she did bathe, in tubs of milk and rose petals. Well, imagine how you're... <laughs> Just imagine how you're going to smell or taste if you've got dried milk all over your body. Whoa! I don't care how many rose petals you put in that milk. Milk is going to curdle and milk is going to turn bitter. But, anyhow, but then you could hide it all with perfumes. And one of the most distinguished ways of identifying your success in society at that time at Versailles was your perfumery. There were people who were masters of perfume. Now, out in the fields where lavender and other wonderful herbs were gathered and and processed, some dried, some put into containers, giant glass containers and fermented, they would then be sold to commercial uh, entrepreneurs, the mercantile class, in jars, big jars. And then they, you would go into their store and then they would test all types of scents. They would take a, a dab of this, dab of that, and put it on a cloth. You'd smell it. I don't like that. Then what if we mix this and this? And then finally you came up with something you liked. Then he would blend that for you, and you would then, that's how you would smell for the next year. Now, women didn't like to wear a scent more than a year because then it seemed like you were out of style. So you would change your perfumes once a year. Now, if you were poor, you couldn't f- afford this. This is very expensive. And these were very esteemed people, the perfumeries. But in the country, they had very exotic ones where they would use dead flesh to actually take corpses and take piece of their part of their body, depending upon the recipe, and put it into these vats. They would take human feces and put it into these vats. Oh, yeah, yeah. They would take bats. They would take the most terrible things and put it in there to try to get some kind of exotic smell so that they could say that ours has the most unique mixture in the world, it's a secret ingredient, and then people would wear these. But if you were poor, then what you would do, you have this one of these little amulets that you would wear around your neck, and in there you would put the most common potpourri items, things that would have a rather good smell, uh, like a, or you could put uh, allspice, or you could put um, uh, a lemongrass, Any number of a hundred different items go into these, and those last about mm, three months, and they were not expensive. But then everybody went to court, over-powdered, over-wigged, over-sweaty, over-stinky, over-perfumed, over-grungy, and there were no manicures, pedicures, there were no, there was nothing of hygiene, but all, all of it was this whole pretense. In fact, uh, Louis XV's most famous mistress uh, the pompadour supported philosophers and artists. And she was given for just her support $63,000 in today's money uh, because she was considered essential to the, uh, the artist community. So remember, perfumery also functioned as medicine. It was not uncommon to mix bizarre animal Components like fox lungs, viper flesh, wolf liver, bat, uh, bear fat, uh, salmonander ashes, even the oil of worm into aromatic blends. They would put gold and silver and pearls crushed up in there also. They would put blood, urine, feces into the mix. So you never knew what you were going to get. And those were given out to people who considered it important. By the way, the the most expensive queen in history in France was Marie Antoinette. 
Her budget in 1785 was 258,000 uh, libraries, or approximately $32 million. That was just for her wardrobe. And that's where she was monitored as Madame Deficit. Even, even the whole idea of the baby's dirty bottom became an element of courtly business. The birth of the um, Louis the uh, Louis Joseph's daughter in 1781 created a fashion trend in a new shade of brown, and the color of the child's soiled nappies. So, and remember, the average uh, French citizen did not eat um, pheasant. They ate bread mixed with grains like rye and wheat. They were coarsely ground on a millstone, often cut with stalks and chafe, and uh, they were healthy, uh, but it tasted like sawdust. Black bread, largely rye, and coarser than anything you'd find today was what was consumed. The royals, they suffered from gout because they had high sugar and high meat, and one of the things they thought would cure the gout is taking the blood of birds, and so there's a period of time where every bird in France they could find had its throat cut and its blood poured on a foot, a toe, an ankle, a thumb, not realizing it was their diet causing that. I'm Gary Nall. That's Above and Beyond Time on our show today. Thank you for listening. Look forward to sharing more tomorrow. Have a nice day. 